feels like a much longer weekend because I was uh, down in the high desert country around San Diego for a couple of days. And I'm telling you that because what I was doing was attending an intensive uh, uh, retreat for advocates for the nonviolent peace force. So I found out a lot about what NP is doing, and I know that's something that you, you all were very interested in. So if you have any other questions about, you know, what countries we're operating in, where things stand, uh, I'm in a better position to answer those questions now. And then, not to be outdone, I also I have an announcement too. Uh, there's a screening, free screening Thursday at 7 p.m. in 110 Barrows of a film called The Peacekeepers. Peacekeepers is a brilliant film about the struggle to save a failed state, namely the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where 3.3 million people have died in the last 10 years. Very bad combination, rich minerals and poor people. And uh, since they're using the term peacekeeping, I just, excuse me. This is an item that comes up for us in nonviolent intervention work also. Uh, these terms, I am pretty sure, were developed by Johann Galtung. He's the source of most of our vocabulary in the field. And he, he makes a distinction among three functions, peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building. Um, and the idea is that peacekeeping is any kind of intervention in a hot conflict to get it cooled down to the point where people can negotiate. So the UN does peacekeeping through threat power, which I have always maintained is a complete contradiction in terms and will never get anywhere. So hopefully I may even be wrong on this point, but alas, I don't think so. But you can also do nonviolent peacekeeping without weapons, of course, and that is frequently what an intervention will do. Amy? We had this debate all weekend. <laughs> I, uh, I'm rather p pessimistic about the UN, but my, ultimately I came to this conclusion after much pressure by friends of mine at the event. But no, seriously, this is what I have always believed anyway. We should always leave it open for the UN to step in and do this, but we should never depend on them. That's, I think that's the winning strategy. Just build it as if they were not there, but have the door open for them to, at any time. Yeah. And that is actually now finally starting to happen. David Hartso, when he was here, he mentioned Rolf Carrier, who is a former UN diplomat. He is arranging for UNESCO and, and UN volunteers and other programs to use nonviolent peace force as a source for trained volunteers, which would be terrific. But the only problem is it's a Catch-22, we don't have enough money to do the training. If we had the money to do the training, we would have a lot of money from the UN. So they're offering us something like $1.3 million, but we have to be able to prime the pump. It's part, part of what we were meeting about this weekend. To prime the pump, we have to get the, the flow started. You know, like <coughs> sip a latte and then you can go on for another paragraph. Case in point. Um, but I, it is very, it's very significant that if you look at the history of peace interventions, which I gave a presentation on it this weekend, so that's why I'm still up on this, you will see that there were a number of proposals made to the UN by people who could have followed through on them. One of them was Vinoba Bhave, whom you've heard about, who was a, probably Gandhi's closest disciple from the spiritual point of view, I think at least as far as known to the public. And he, uh, during the, whoa, I'm not sure I remember what crisis it was. It might have been when the Cyprus thing blew up or, or Kashmir. He offered the UN to raise, that he would raise 100,000 unarmed volunteers. And he got absolutely no response. And although this is disappointing, I think after a while, after you've been through these disappointments decade after decade, 
you begin to ask yourself, what is the handwriting on the wall here? What are we supposed to be learning from this? And I've come to the conclusion that there's something, again, extremely appropriate and consistent and therefore effective about peace, nonviolent peacemaking not being centralized. It has to be organized, God knows. You know, you, you, there's the case of Mir Sada, this one organization that tried to drag people into uh, the Balkans and it was a disaster. And in one case, a lady saw a, a sign on a bar it, on Saturday night and Sunday morning she was on a ship going over to the Balkans. She had never heard of this before, had no idea what to do, had no idea who was going to feed her. And she be, they were all a huge security risk for the people on the ground. So just jumping into this without organization and without preparation is a huge mistake. At the same time, the kind of organization that we tend to be familiar with, which is pyramidal, hierarchical, top-down, head honcho, hanchitos, <laughs> and the rest of it, um, it's, that's not appropriate. And somehow it's very easy to organize violence in that way and it makes a lot of sense. It makes a very clear statement. But it's not very easy to organize nonviolence that way. So um, that doesn't mean that the UN will never get on board. And in some cases, people, individuals in the UN have understood this already. But to get it to do, to adopt this as an organization, we're going to have to build it and make sure that when they come on board, they don't sink the ship. Like they don't, you know, that, or get just to give you one little vignette, which is kind of an example of how this could happen. Uh, not Mir Sada, but another group that was better organized. And one of the larger nonviolent peace teams that's been mounted so far was it had about 2,000 people. This was Balkan peace teams. And you can ask your husband about this. And they had a group that was ready to go into Sarajevo through Sniper's Alley. I'm going to be in Sarajevo in September. Did I tell you guys that? Oh, let me interrupt this for a brief announcement from our <laughs> – from our sponsor. Uh, my book has been translated into Serbo-Croatian and I'll be going over there to launch it in September with a brief stopover in Germany. <laughs> Refreshments. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, close parenthesis. Back to topic. <laughs> Here they are. Thank you. They are poised, ready to go down into the city through Sniper's Alley. Nobody went through that without getting shot, hence the name. And vroom, up comes UN Pro 4, the United Nations force in uh, the Balkans. And they said, we will put an armored personnel carrier. They had two buses that they were going to go down in. We'll put an armored personnel, an APC in front of your buses and an APC behind them to protect them. So the Balkan peace team people had a brief consultation and said, uh, Spasibo, but not no spasibo. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. If we were to do that, it would completely violate everything that we're here for, and we would be rendered incoherent. I'm sure they didn't use that expression. That's the way I tend to think about it. So they took these two beat up buses that all they said Balkan peace teams on the side, and they went down through Cypress, Sniper's Alley, and not a single shot was fired. So it's good to remember that. The, the UN way of doing things is. Adverse, it's going to get us in trouble with Nagler's Law. Okay. So what I would like to do today, if we can finally get started, is talk a little bit about the CHIPCO movement and then stop and throw it wide open for a complete review for the midterm, which you'll be having on Thursday, if you recall. And uh, uh, we can go the whole rest of the time with that. But if we run out of speed or steam and we figure we know everything, no need to talk anymore, then I would like to show you about 12 minutes of a film about Judy Bari and the Earth First movement. But you won't be responsible for that material for the midterm. So if we're still rolling, we, uh, we won't stop. We'll keep on rolling. So I made a point of bringing a very light projector today. So <laughs> not a huge burden for John. So uh, I thought it might be a good idea to do one of our chart uh, things for this movement. And again, it, the reason I'm dwelling on it a little is that it 
plays an intermediate role between the Gandhian era and the contemporary era, which our course is nominally about. Um, so the, the issue was deforestation, something that we are unfortunately on intimate terms with. 97% of the old growth redwoods in California, finito. We're, we're working on saving the remaining 3% at this point. So, and the next thing we might consider is the players. And I would say that you have the classic modern configuration of corporations running governments instead of the other way around. You know, governments used to be a way to put a check on the greed of corporations. And now we have something called free trade and that whole relationship, as they would say in French. I don't know why I want to – it's a very pretty word in French. Bouleversé. They've completely turned on its head. So actually people who are in the progressive movements of one kind or another oddly find themselves trying to rescue the state, which they've been against classically for the last hundred and so many years. You know, communism promised us the state would wither away. It failed to do that. Much worse, it now becomes a fig leaf for corporate systems. Classic, very sad case of this at the end of the uh, anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, which basically was a successful struggle on many levels. It was written into the South African constitution that basically food, clothing, and shelter was the right of every citizen of South Africa. Everybody's got a right to adequate housing, modest income, and so forth. And 20 years later, none of that was there. Why? Because the IMF came in and said, you have to restructure and you know what that means. I hope you know what that means because a lot of people don't. It means the poor people get screwed. <laughs> That's what it basically means. So there was a statement by one person who had been in that movement who said, we rose up to struggle against the – we rose up to take possession of the state and succeeded only to find that it no longer existed. So I hope with this grim introduction, trying to identify what's going on here. Corporations want to come into the Garwal Himalaya and other sections of the Himalayan uh, low-lying, relatively low-altitude Himalayan forests and they want to do clear-cutting for very good reasons, of course. In some cases, they want to cut down all the ash trees so that they can make tennis rackets out of them, things like that. And the adversary to this is – oh, what are we going to call it? Uh, all right. I will use an old-fashioned term and I hope that's all right. It's the people who happen to live there, the indigenous people. And this issue has, has a background um, which I think you may have come across. And that is nearly 400 years before this episode dawns in the 1970s, there was a group called the Vishnoi or Bishnoi. In that part of India, it's hard to distinguish between V and B. And as is often the case in India, a community is more than just a bunch of people who happen to live in one place. They actually develop a kind of religious culture which is somewhat distinct for them. And because they're hill people, they're living on the Himalayas, living in a balanced, sustainable, symbiotic relationship with the forest, the forest becomes sacred for them. So these people of Vishnoi, they had a uh, constitution, if you will, which almost – I think it almost even had a written form. And it, it said nobody is going to cut down a living tree except under very special, <laughs> carefully controlled circumstances. And over a period of uh, 20 or so years, the government had been supporting multinationals 
uh, a lot of them actually from Los Angeles, to go in and utilize, develop all of these euphemistic terms as though you know, it wasn't developed if it's just being the world, uh, the forest. The f villagers didn't own the forest in the legalistic sense, but they were the custodians of the forest and the forest was their – okay, if you don't mind my using a somewhat sentimental word – the forest was their mother. It was providing them with fuel and uh, in some cases tree crops and a balanced, sustainable environment. Well, immediately when the corporations came in, they didn't like the fact that it was a mixed forest that's too messy and it's hard to exploit. So they cut down a lot of one kind of tree and they planted a certain type of pine tree called cheer pine, which is a deciduous tree. The needles shed. They lie on the ground and prevent things from growing. It's a kind of mulch. And what does that mean? Well, what it meant was in one year, 70 village was villages, not people, 70 villages were swept away by floods. So we're going from poverty to destitution on a fast track because our life is being wiped out. And I'm going to make a special category for outside help. And they were conspicuously blessed by this unusual woman, Madeline Slade, uh, took the Sanskrit name Mirabain. Mira was a very, very famous saint in the 16th century. And Bain means sister. So this is Sister Mira. And she was very, very close to Gandhi at one time. And I'm not going to go into her whole history. But toward the end of Gandhi's life, he started sending people out to remote villages to start building them up from the grassroots. He thought, you know, we've done what we can. We're on our way to getting political independence, but we're not anywhere near where I wanted us to be in terms of rebuilding India along spiritual lines, along its own traditional culture. So I want you to go out to these villages and help the people rebuild. So she, by coincidence – ha, 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 you know, we, nobody believes in coincidences anymore. This is Berkeley, right? This is 21st century. By divine providence or whatever, <laughs> she went to this village. It was right smack in the middle of this area and started writing about the deforestation and the disastrous flooding that was happening. So the world gets alerted to this. And then there were two uh, Indian fellows. One was named Sundralal Bahuguna. And the other one, I think, was – I'm not totally sure of his first name, but his last name was Bhatt. And both Mira Bain and Bahuguna had been with Gandhi. So what we're talking about here is a rare case of direct transmission, right? Even more direct in a sense than Larzac, which is our Western European parallel to this because uh, these people had been really spent a lot of time with Gandhi. In one case, actually in India. And they start to constitute – I want to bring in a, a concept here of which this is sort of a version. And this, again, a concept by Galtung. Where would we be without this man? The great chain of nonviolence. You've heard of the great chain of being, which was believed in the Middle Ages that you had creatures that were very low down on the chain and then you get – to Berkeley students and you start working your way up to the very top. Anyway, the great chain of nonviolence is this idea that you might be a disenfranchised, voiceless person, part of what they would call in German Marxism, lumpenproletariat. You know, you're just a nondescript worker in some factory or you're a domestic worker in some white woman's household. How are you going to get to the governor? Well, one way that we think of doing that immediately is we all get together. There's a million of us and it would embarrass the governor if we stand outside his office and don't let him drive his limousine into the parking lot. That's one way. Go multiply ourselves by numbers. Another way is one really conspicuous person doing one conspicuous thing at the right time can have a tremendous impact. That's another way. We've seen examples of that. 
But there's also a third possible mechanism is that you get to be friends with the lady that you're working for. Her husband goes bowling with the police commissioner. And so you build your way up through just a chain of human associations to the top that you need to reach if indeed political power holders are to be thought of as at the top of anything. So you had these villagers – oh, I'm sorry. I started to say something about uh, the Vishnoi and their past history in the background. Then I – strangely enough, I got sidetracked. <coughs> How did that happen? Anyway, in the 17th century, actually early 18th century, there was a Maharaja who wanted to clear cut a forest. They didn't use the term in those days, of course. He wanted to cut down all the trees in a forest so that he could build, I don't know, a stable for his <coughs> elephants or something like that or a gambling casino or something, some useful item like that. And the women in the village, knowing that their livelihood depended on that, begged him to stop. When he didn't stop, they committed suicide. The story goes that 400 of them jumped over a cliff, 400 of them. This brought the Maharaja to his senses, so the story tells us. Okay, So this is at least acting as if you're at the third stage of the escalation curve and perhaps they were. Um, is this a recommended mechanism? <laughs> no. I think we would, the peace movement is small enough already. But it goes to show you very dramatically what you had to do to reach the top from the village bottom. So the fact that you have Miraban who is c in contact with global civilization and Bahuguna who is also a very educated young man who uh, you know, knows how to do things and organize things. He has Gandhian training. They get pulled into it. That makes the link in between the villagers who have no voice, no connection otherwise that they know of, that they know how to exploit with the government. And in addition, we've talked frequently about some of these people like Hildegard Gossmeyer, the role that she played in the Philippines, very likely to come up on the midterm that uh, she comes in with training and experience. Actually, I just found out something about her that I didn't know until yesterday. She was actually tortured seriously in, in Guatemala at one point. So, and you overcame that in a personal way and didn't hate her oppressors and ended up being able to be very active without being overcome by fear. So it's not just what she knew from reading books and stuff. She had gone through a very deep transformation and was very, very helpful for those people. And that's the role that Mirabin played. But then there was something that Mirabin could not do very easily and that was to walk from village to village singing songs from the Himalayan region and awakening people and being immediately accepted by them. She couldn't do that because she was a white lady. She didn't know the language. She didn't know the culture very well. But this Bahuguna could do. So then when we get to techniques, one of them was the Parayatra, which means pilgrimage on foot. Yatra means a going or a especially a religious going, a pilgrimage, and Pada means foot. Next time you visit your podiatrist, Matthew, you tell him that he has a very distinguished title that is a second cousin to the Sanskrit word pada. He'll be thrilled or she. <laughs> That's right. There you go. So uh, Sundarlal Bahuguna at certain periods during the campaign goes on these like 6,000 kilometer treks where he visits village after village after village and uh, bringing in poets from the region and poetry and song plays an important role in, in spiriting people and giving them some slogans like – see, I might be able to remember this one. Uh, uh, I'm 
not entirely sure how that word is spelled. But basically, this says, Aj Himalaya Jagega, today the Himalaya arises. Isn't that a nice image? Today the Himalaya arises. Krul Kulkara Kulhara. Oh, I remember. <laughs> the cruel axe has been scared off. Right, the cruel axe has been scared off today. The Himalaya arises. So they would go around chanting things like this. So uh, you see you have people at their appropriate stages doing what they have to do. The most important technique, the one that gives the movement its name, is, of course, chipko, which means hugging. And apparently, we don't know for sure how this started, but it definitely began in the village. It was not something that Miraben thought up. She didn't come in and say, I have a good idea. Why don't you guys or gals go out and hug the trees? Um, there was a meeting. Apparently, we're not entirely sure of this, but apparently there's a meeting. And one old man got up and said, when a leopard jumps on a child, the mother protects it with her own body. Immediately they got the idea, and the next morning they were out there hugging the trees so that the axemen could not come in and chop them down. And uh, it, it was a, a long-term movement. Another thing we could talk about is the time frame and the outcome. Everybody got this? Aj Himalaya Jagega. We're going to sing it at the midterm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a long A, actually. <laughs> Oops. This is very embarrassing because I'm sure there's at least 100 people watching this lecture in India. And <laughs> there's the ah! <laughs> uh, okay, time frame. Outcome. So the time frame is actually from the mid 70s, although the problem started earlier mid-70s to the present. It is the struggle is still, in a sense, going on. The outcome, I would say, was a mixed success. Uh, there, a lot of felling was prevented. But people who go back and visit the region today will get – they'll bring back depressing reports that somehow they figured out a way to do it even though – the villagers aren't allowing them to. So I'm, ho I'm hoping that you'll find this kind of scheme and way of spreading things out convenient and helpful for the, all the uh, campaigns that we have to look at. But I now want to get to the most important criteria, the most important columns, and then I will stop and make myself available to you for your questions. And those, quote, most important columns are – what kind of nonviolence was involved, if any? Is, is it strategic, principled, or some mixture of the two? And finally, let's put it this way. What kind of program was involved? Was it constructive program or obstructive program? And, or both. And as I think I've mentioned to you, it's very likely that we'll find as we go through the rest of the semester that a campaign will tend to be very strong on one but very weak on the other. There's very few that really get the two things in balance. And then you want to still take another step and have some kind of strategic vision where you can tell when to use which. So absent a Gandhi, how are you going to decide all of this? So in the interest of time and because you haven't had much of a chance to read up about Chipko, I'll just fill in these columns myself. And I would say that it's, it's pretty close to principled nonviolence. It's as close as you're going to get in Pax 164B. Okay? Pax 164A was the squeaky clean course where you had to practically be a Gandhi or we wouldn't study you. But <laughs> in B, we realized we're dealing with ordinary flesh. And, uh, but because the movement was primarily a women's movement, some men were involved, but only if they were sober. So that definitely limited their participation. <laughs> this is a big problem in some parts of India and other parts of the world also. 
Um, it was primarily a women's movement. They did bring some of the men in. And of course, Bahuguna played a very strong leadership role in terms of being prominent and active, going from place to place, making representations to the government. It was he and not Miraban that was able to do that. But it was mainly a women's movement and they mainly – I don't know of a single episode where they threatened the axe men with violence. They um, – it doesn't mean there wasn't one. And who knows what's actually going on in their heart. But I think as far as we can tell, and that's as close as we're going to get this semester, it was a movement where they wanted to protect life. And they were going to do it in a – yes, an interpositionary posture, getting in between what you guys are trying to do and the thing. But they were not against the axemen. And of course they didn't use any violence. So pretty darn close, I'd say. Pretty darn close to a principled nonviolent movement. And I would say that it was very strong on OP and it, it had a little bit of constructive program in the sense that they would be blocking the felling of the trees. But it's not like they were trying to rebuild their whole economy or stuff like that. There was some. The Bahuguna came in there and he, he raised the consciousness of the people politically. It was definitely what uh, Paolo Freire calls conscientizao. I'm probably not pronouncing that very well. Not Pretty bad? Fair. Pretty fair? How would you say it, Colin? There you go. Conscientizao. There. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> so it's what we call conscientizing, which is a disgusting word, but it sounds much better in uh, in Portuguese. But it means getting the people up to the point where they can act politically and, and represent their case to the powers that be. And Matthew, did you? Wasn't there something about anti alcoholism? Well, actually, that is a yeah, that is a good point. And in fact, uh, having mentioned the alcohol problem, it would not be fair not to mention that there was an, al an anti-alcohol solution. Yeah, that actually was throughout the entire Gandhian movement in India from the late 30s onwards that uh, the drink evil is, one, is the name of one of the 18 programs in constructive program. Wherever he went, people had to stop boozing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, John? Mm -hmm. Okay, John's question is a very good one. Did they even need constructive program given that before the, the industrial style felling started, they had a perfectly good lifestyle there? This um, – a balanced economy and so forth. This leads to a very interesting point about globalization. And I'm not calling it globalization from above or from below for the time being. But if you think about um, indigenous forms of nonviolent culture before Gandhi comes on the scene and we start studying him and writing books about it and all the rest of it, there was a, an English anthropologist by the name of Fabro who collected a, a study of something like 55 countries, 55 cultures where they had pronounced nonviolent mechanisms in their culture. But – and it's a very valuable resource. There's no denying that. But unfortunately, when these um, – it's very hard to find a non-prejudicial word for people living at this cultural level. But let's say pre-industrial people, they have these nonviolent mechanisms in their culture. They can be very effective. But what's going to happen to them? after contact. When they come up against the developed world, what's going to happen? Uh, in at least uh, one case and probably a lot more that I don't know about, these people became super violent when they were dragged in to, let's say, the Cold War. I'm thinking of the uh, uh, Semoy, people who lived in mountains high up in the middle of uh, Malay Peninsula 
They were very, very nonviolent. But when they got caught up in the Cold War, they were cannibalistic. They, they went ballistic. They were absolutely uncontrollable. So the question is, yeah, you might have a sustainable forest economy which will work fine if you're going to be left alone. But what do you think the chances are that you're going to be left alone? There's a, so what we now need is constructive program to rebuild an economy which will use the indigenous balance but allow it to interact with the outside world. Right? That's, that's the challenge. I, I kind of wish it were not. You know, I wish that we'd leave those people alone and they could be happy and we'd be happy. Everybody would be happy. It's not going to be like that. There's a, f there's a documentary film called um, um, A Message to, to Little Brother, which is about a community that lives high up in the Colombian highlands, which is now completely out of contact with the coastal Indians because in the 17th century, of course, the uh, Europeans came in and cut them off. So they are totally enclaved. They live in these little island pocket fastnesses up on the, uh, Himo in, uh, the Andes. And guess what? Their life is deteriorating even though they have absolutely no contact with the European South Americans because they're destroying the environment so fast that they can't live up there on their hilltops anymore. So there was one Indian in this group. I think this film is legitimate. It's, it's so fantastic. It seems like it's almost like a science fiction story, but it looks like it's probably legitimate. There was one Indian who happened to go down to the lowlands and marry a Spanish-speaking person so he could translate. And they actually invited a film crew. That's how we have this documentary. They invited a film crew to come up, walk across these rope bridges with their heavy cameras, and uh, film this village when they gave us a lecture. They said, you see that mountain that should be all green and it's still brown? This is a, what are you doing, little brother? You're destroying the world. So much as we may like to preserve these indigenous economies, I think what we have to do is preserve the principles that they developed and apply them in a way which enables them to live in the modern world. Because the one thing that I do believe about the globalist model, uh, their ideology is that it's here. There's no, we're not going back to little isolated communities. Uh, that would be romantic and nostalgic. I mean, and I happen to be both romantic and nostalgic, but <laughs> it doesn't work in the real world. Okay. So, uh, by way of transition to uh, the rest of today, uh, which wraps up what we've studied so far, as you're probably aware, there's going to be two questions. Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. <laughs> that wasn't very informative. Roman one will be uh, IDs, identification. And that's where you'll mainly use that list that I emailed out to all of you. But we won't be entirely confined to that list. It may be something that we didn't think of at that time. So don't be indignant if a term comes up that wasn't on that list. But most of them will be from that list. And what I will ask you to do is briefly identify what this is. Uh, there was a system that we cooked up for last semester, which I would love to share with you, but I have to find some chalk. Ah. Oh, thank you, Sophie. Yeah. Good. Um, oh, <laughs> this is funny, isn't it? I hope you'll find it funny. <laughs> I started talking about these three things and I, I got sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> that's my middle name, you know, Mike Sidetrack Nagler, they call him. Peace, peacekeeping is getting in the way of hot conflict and chilling it out. Peacemaking is trying to resolve the issue that caused the conflict. And peace building is creating new institutions, cultural, social, economic, so that problems like that won't arise. Okay. Um, now that you've got that, take it away. 
so what you should think of when you start one of these IDs is the first thing that you want to do with a term is to define it. In other words, don't start by giving some characteristic. Don't say, this is a very important item. It wouldn't be on the exam if it weren't an important item. We don't, we don't need your reactions. <laughs> you can put that in the course evaluation. <laughs> but tell us what the thing is. So if I were to take – suppose you had CBD. And you know, you're hip enough to know that that stands for civilian-based defense. You would start by saying one of the two ways that nonviolence can be deployed against large-scale armed conflict, parenthesis, quote, war, unquote. And then you would say it, it is what happens when the citizens of a regime resist occupation of their um, – cultural institutions not of their territory. So you don't, you don't do what's called shallow interdiction, keeping the enemy from getting into the country. You can't do that. Once they come in, you don't let them take it over. So that's civilian-based defense. So you, that's how you would define it. And then in some cases, you would need to attribute the term to the person who developed it. And that's important in our field because the field is so new in the vocabulary is not yet agreed upon. So, for example, suppose you had Nagler's Law was an ID. <laughs> Whom would you attribute it to? Yeah, who is buried in Grant's tomb anyway? Very good. So that may or may not be appropriate. Definition is absolutely indispensable, but attribution may or may not be necessary. Uh, then you want to contextualize it in the sense that if it's part of a set, tell what the rest of the set is. So classically, last semester I would put out there, say, exchange power. And you have to say it's the type of power which derives from the exchange of desired goods. Like, give me what I want, I'll give you what you want. It was developed, the concept was developed by Kenneth Boulding. It is the middle part of an important series which goes from threat power to exchange power, to integrative power. And then you do an evaluation of why is this thing important for nonviolence? So let's keep that in the same, same grammatical voice. Evaluate. Um, and you say it is integrative power, which is basically the definition of how nonviolence works. It is the power of nonviolence. But the one that you're talking about is not. So in some cases, this may not be necessary because there isn't, the, the, it, there isn't a set. And in some cases, it may be obvious how it relates to nonviolence. So do be thinking of all of these. And we sometimes call this the DACE system. And I'm going to patent it and sell it for nonviolence courses around the world. <laughs> Make $10. Um, but if you keep that little formula in mind, define first, then attri attribute, contextualize, and evaluate as necessary. And really all of this can be done in two or three sentences. And probably you'll have 12 terms. Read them over. Think which 10 you want to take. And then put the number and the term and then go. John? Yeah, if you have an event like suppose uh, – well, an event or a campaign. But suppose I were to say the Sharpeville massacre. Okay, that's an event. You would definitely want to say why it was important, what principles are right. In fact, that's a good point that uh, John is making. You should know the principles of nonviolence cold and use them all the time. I mean, don't worry about using them too much. You can – it's not – this is not a matter of style. You can be corny about this. <laughs> Say, this involves the principles of A, B, C. Just keep piling it on. I mean, realistically, don't, don't just put words in there to fill out the paragraph. <laughs> they have to make sense, right? Uh, we'll assumedly still be awake at the time that we're grading your midterm. But uh, don't be afraid to use these principles. That's the whole point is to be able to see the principles at work in the episodes on the ground. 
Okay? So that's the IDs, and the essay will it'll ask you to give like historical. Again, you'll have a choice, probably give you three of which you choose one. Uh, take a historical overview of a certain period and or oh, it, essays can be all over the map really. It's, it's really kind of difficult to prepare for them. You'll be much better prepared for the final exam for the essay questions there. Okay. Now let's get to content, substance, things that – I mean like for maybe I got sidetracked at some point during the semester and didn't finish something and you'll want to ask me about that. Okay. So Andrea's question is about base communities. And uh, well, actually, you know, that's a, that's a column that we didn't put in here. Formats, new inventions, stuff like that. Um, originally, it was – I think it was not an acronym. It just was the word BASE. And it developed in Central America and South America. And it was also brought in to the Philippines. And you saw an example of a BASE community meeting there in um, – in Mindanao, I think. Okay, but having said that, and I haven't really – that's not the definition. That's just telling you where it comes from. Who would like to define it? What is a base community? ¿Qué es una comunidad de base? Marcela? Mm. Interesting. I would actually use a different term for those people. I would call those people early adopters. Like if you go into any community there will be s and you say, we ought to try to do this nonviolently, you'll get some people who will say, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, including even some men. S but that is, that is uh, kind of an artificial community. That's just sort of an interest group. A base community is a real community where people got together frequently and it was in the context of evangelical Christianity which has become a powerful force in Central and South America. You, uh, I can vividly remember walking through the streets of Leon at uh, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. Everything is shut down except one building where people are standing up and holding hands and praising the Lord and singing loud music. And uh, so it's because the way the Church, the Catholic Church got squeezed during the revolutionary periods in the, from the 40s to the 60s that they ended up in an awkward position and people started defecting from them into um, other kinds of Christianity. Now, having said that, to be sure, the base communities in the Philippines were Catholic. There's almost no evangelical Christianity there. But these are real communities where people got together got to know each other personally and socially and talked about what they were going to do about their problem. And you remember that scene in that slum in um, Manila, I think is where it was, where uh, people were saying the problem is that the government isn't listening to us. They don't know about our poverty. What are we going to do about it? So it kind of, uh, it kind of combined Christian cultivation or religious cultivation with a grappling with the political problems that the community faced. And because there was in many cases no other organization to do that, the base communities became very important as a way of building movements. Now there's also a modern version of this that Buddhist groups here are starting to build. Uh, and I think this stands for Buddhist Alliance for Social Engagement, but I'm not entirely sure. And these are rather different in that they are not um, neighborhood communities. They're more like the kinds of communities that you started talking about, Marcella. And people are pulled together. The train Meta is working with them actually on this. Pull together, they get training, and they learn how to do social action based on meditation practice. And they, but they have deliberately chosen that acronym because they wanted to, to, to signal the fact that they were like the base communities. Catherine? I think it stands for Buddhist Alliances for Social Engagement, but don't 
quote me on that. Alex? I just wondered, is this different Well, that's a good question. How are base communities different from affinity groups? I'm hoping that some of you can answer that question, even though we really haven't gotten to this in great detail yet. I know that's coming up a little bit later. But I bet some of you have had some experience with affinity groups, knowing you as I do. Anybody? Have to Amy? Well, affinity groups, people don't have to be affinity to each other. Right. And it seems like the World Trade Protest right. in Seattle is a good example of that, where you uh -huh. have people from a lot of different interests and backgrounds uh -huh. together. So, like, kind of work for a common cause, like, you have Mormon troops, like, uh -huh. people from all over the world and stuff, mm -hmm. like, right? Mm -hmm. Environmental groups, all mm -hmm. coming together. Yeah, in Seattle? Tens of thousands of people were mobilized. And you need a way for them to get organized. And you don't want to use the old-fashioned way where you take one charismatic male, put him at the top, and down it goes from there. So it's uh, much more from the ground up. It's called Basis Demokratie in the German Greens Party. And what you do is pull together people who have an affinity, the hence the name affinity group. And it could be um, – I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know. But it could be almost anything, I guess. You know, you all, you all, all play the guitar or you eat granola or <laughs> something like that. Uh, or, that it, or that you come from a given region. Uh, actually, granola wouldn't work because I'm sure they all eat granola. But, uh, uh, and the point is the not, that, not just that you come together but that you function as a unit throughout that campaign. So you have a representative who goes up to uh, up a hierarchy to a group that's trying to make decisions with you. And very often affinity groups will stay together after a campaign. And that's terrific because one of the biggest problems in the whole peace movement for the last – for the whole period that we're studying has been continuity. Yeah, every episode you have to reinvent the wheel get out to the old Rolodexes and start all over again with uh, your Excel sheets. <laughs> Incidentally, this is one of the ways that uh, third-party nonviolent intervention has been helpful to the whole peace movement is that people who have gotten involved in an attempt to interpose themselves in a conflict, that'll fall apart. No permanent thing will come out of that. But they will roll over and be the same people who will go on to found Peace Brigades International or Witness for Peace. So just because the thing has been happening quickly enough, there's been enough – on the personal level, enough continuity. Continuity has been a huge problem. And because of that, learning has been an even huger problem. R.B.? Did you talk about the effervescence? I'm not sure I did talk about the effervescence of the crowd. It's a sort of bubbly topic. Uh, what it refers to – well, does someone else know? Does, did someone come across it in our reading? I'm pretty sure it was in – yeah, Zoe? Yeah. It, I, th I bet it would come from Durkheim. It sounds Durkheimian to me. <laughs> but what mm – -hmm. That you're exactly right. It is not necessarily positive or negative. And even when it's positive, it's partly negative. But go ahead. Tell us what it is. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Momentum, fervor, those are all very good words for it. I'm not sure that it's essential that it be one person who sparks the crowd, but it usually is, I bet. But there's a strange phenomenon. The crowds themselves can somehow develop this fervor and it can make people capable of doing things that they would not be able to do by themselves. And they can be practically unstoppable. However, the term effervescence connotes what?
it's exactly that's exactly what it is. It's just a positive spin on mob psychology is all it is, and that's why it's not such a great thing because the crowd can turn. And in fact, Rene Girard, who is the uh, expert on scapegoating, he has shown that the typical pattern is hail to the chief, jail to the chief. You know, the crowd will put somebody up on the pedestal and make him into a god. Then having made him into a god, they will sacrifice him. So the problem with effervescence is that it's effervescent. Duh. <laughs> you know, you can't build a movement on seafoam. You know? You have to run around the crowd and get everybody's emails <laughs> and talk to them later when they're sober <laughs> and see if they're still interested. And this was the great, great power of constructive programming. That's where Gandhi really was a genius to do that because you could do spinning anytime and it didn't depend on a momentary enthusiasm. It drew upon much deeper commitments, deeper energies. So from a political point of view, a sociological point of view, you might get very excited by crowd effervescence, but if you're really trying to build nonviolence, you should be somewhat suspicious of it. Matthias. So spinning? spinning means uh, to take something off. Uh, how could context, how oh, the spinning. Cotton. No, that was a different kind of spin. The spinning cotton. Anybody could spin cotton. Quetschen am Spinnrader. Meine Ruhe ist hin, mein Herz ist schwer. Okay. Yes. I should stop quoting Goethe. It's really getting embarrassing. John. Monkey wrenching. That is something which, again, we were just about to get to. Didn't quite get there. It's a good thing to know about it. Uh, it's a good thing to know about. Has anybody been involved with a group? That's considering should we to monkey wrench or not to monkey wrench? That is the question. It comes from an, an English language idiom to throw a monkey wrench into the works, which means it's, it's like sabotage. And uh, in particular, it has come up in the environmental movements where in their intense frustration and in their anger, against machinery, people have blocked the operations of certain machines. If we get to it, and we will get to it either today or after the spring break, we're going to show how this issue was dealt with in conjunction with the deforestation, reforestation movement of Earth First. It leads to, I mean, in A we talked about this to some degree. It's basically property destruction. And like all forms of property destruction, it's a very weak way to change anybody's mind. So it is definitely in the area of coercion, not of persuasion. And so it's not something that we want to rely on. And if it's really damaging, we don't even want to do it if we are trying to be a principled nonviolent movement. What else? Yes, some. Um, Sarah. Well, uh, the right to health. Droit d'ingérence. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good one. Suppose you had that on the exam, and I would. You would get it translated. So. This being an American university, droit d'ingérence. What's the definition, first of all? Pardon? <laughs> Let's go to that first. Qu'est-ce que c'est que le droit d'ingérence? Que es el derecho de. Hmm. How do you say intervene? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sidetracking us. I'll, I'll talk to you later. What, what is it? What is this thing? Yes, thank you. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
That was excellent. So Sethi started by saying it is a concept in international law. I would say that it's not a concept which is enshrined in international law. You will not find, you know, you can go to The Hague and you will not find droit d'ingérence written into law. But you know, I don't think it's part of the Geneva Protocols or anything. But it's a concept that individuals, I don't say they were required, but at least that they have the right to intervene in a state if that state's apparatus has failed to protect its own people at a very basic level. Yeah. Amy? Uh -huh. Responsibility to protect, yeah. Yes. Has to pick up that responsibility, right. If a state fails like when the new Serbian state was driving out the Albanians from the Kosovo region, that was regarded as a failure of the Serbian state to protect its own population and there was a right then to intervene and do something about that. Not necessarily to bomb them for 78 days, but that's with the poverty of imagination. That's all they, they came up with. Okay, I don't know whom to attribute this to, uh, contextualize it. I, it's not, I, I suppose you could say it's a part of a growing body of peace law. But to evaluate it is important. Why is this important for us in peace development today? Nick, did you want to? I didn't quite catch the end. Yeah, that. Well, that – what you're talking about I think would get us into what we sometimes call peace imperialism where you go into a country on a pretext of protection. And in effect, the Indian Raj was in India for that reason because the, the, the final pretext that they had after they ran out of the uh, lesser breed without the law, Rudyard Kipling pretext that we're bringing you civilization. The pretext they had was that if we pull out, what's going to happen between Hindus and Muslims? Not mentioning that the debate was they who had driven the two communities apart. But that's – that you're talking about how it could be abused. But I'm thinking of if not abused, if properly understood, why is it so important for us? Zoe? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's, two, there's two answers to the question, a minor one and a major one. And Zoe is giving us the major one, that it is a reflection of the most basic underlying principle of principled nonviolence, which is the sanctity of the individual, if I may use that term. That the sanctity of the individual trumps the authority of the state. I want to put it that way. That occurred to me in the desert this weekend. I hope you like it. Because the state has more people in it than an individual has, <laughs> there is this tendency to think that the state is much more important than any person. And it has eminent domain. It can make you sell them your house and stuff like that. But at a point where the state fails in the conspicuous way, we have to go in to assert the value and the importance of the individual against any collective. That's the most important reason. The minor reason is that unless we have this right, we cannot do third-party nonviolent intervention. And then Nagler's favorite form of peacekeeping is no longer possible. Okay, good. Yes, Michael? Droit means right and ingérer means to intervene, to in interpose oneself. So it's the right of intervening. Does anyone actually know French? Does, does this have a circonflex? It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. That's okay? Okay. Good. I think, yeah. Okay. Phew. I know this is going out all over the world, so the whole, the whole European Union is going to be seeing this, I don't think. <laughs> We're not just these provincial Americans who don't know anything. Yes, Arby. Uh, 
Uh, only in some cases. For an ID, only in some cases. But if you're talking about an event in your essay question, obviously you do want to know approximately when it happened and what was the outcome. Yeah. Okay. Alex. Um, I know that has to do with the visualization Yes. The power of uh-huh. I can talk about the power of vulnerability. I'm not sure I can talk about it cogently. It's uh, something a little difficult to define. I did use the Deer King story, A, because it's one of my favorite stories, and B, because it illustrates this pretty well. But when we first heard it in this course was in the, within the film uh, uh, Where There Is Hatred. It was a young Catholic priest up in the mountains in the Philippines talking about how the people decided that they had to use their vulnerability. He was saying, remember, we had, to dis we had to figure out how to turn our vulnerability into a weapon. I don't know if he used the term weapon. Maybe he used it into a, a force or an implement or something like that. Um, it's, a, it's a startling idea. It's kind of meant to turn, us, turn our thinking on its head, which is good. And to get us to think that the power to dominate or to threaten or to harm is one kind of power, but we really miss the essence of what it means to be human if we think that's the only kind of power that we have. And that there's another kind of, a power, of power which is an appeal to integrate. That's integrative power. And connected with that, there is the power of vulnerability. Now, as a principle, it has been used way, way back in animal behavior. You know, if you see an alpha male dog ganging up on a beta male dog or beta female dog. Even let's say a beta male dog will make a better story. The beta male dog will do something that caninologists call going puppy. It will lie on its back and put its paws up in the air and say, I'm helpless. And it, it might even pee, you know, to show that it's, it's just totally – it's a baby. It needs your protection. And what, it, what that accomplishes is it presses a different button inside Mr. Mr. Alfie, uh, whatever the name of the alpha male dog is. And instead of <laughs> thinking of the beta dog as a potential rival or a victim, he thinks of that dog as a subject that needs care. Now, in human beings, this dynamic is still built in there and there's no harm in appealing to it. But, you know, wi within reason, we have to realize we're human beings. I, if I'm on a demonstration and I, if someone starts beating me up, I am not going to lie on my back and <laughs> wave my paws in the air, much less any of the other stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important for us to realize that indeed you can change people by, by what? By laying down your capacity to harm them, deliberately laying it down. Not saying, you know, please don't hurt me. I don't have a way to defend myself. But saying, here, you see my – here's my gun, okay? I'm putting it down on the table. I'm not going to use it. Go ahead. Do what you want. If you saw uh, Hotel Rwanda, there's a very, very moving scene that I think we might almost try and get a clip of for our DVD, Andrea, uh, where our hero, Paul Rusagavene, uh, he is – the Hutu general is pointing a pistol at him. He's just – Paul has just said something very threatening to him. And instead of you know, trying to knock the gun out of his hand or something, he said, go ahead and kill me. It would be a blessing. And he just – the guy immediately puts his gun down. Uh, I have a friend who uh, – I think I told you the story – had to disarm a child soldier in Rwanda. And he had a sidearm and he decided not to use it. And he just walked up to this boy without taking his gun out of the holster. So these are all examples that somehow by not being threatening and even further than that, Rendering yourself open to the threat of the, of the other, of the opponent, you can change that opponent. Yes, Arby. Um, I know that graphs is about interaction and gesturing, but would you have to 
Actually, that escalation curve that you were referring to is not only about insurrectionary movements. It's about any kind of oppositional movement. And I suppose what we're talking about is stage three. If, if the opponent actually can kill you, then if you want to use your vulnerability as a mechanism for changing the situation, you are risking your life. You've got to be willing to write it down. Let me hasten to add. The power of vulnerability doesn't always, quote, work, unquote. No, don't come back here with a black eye uh, from the vigil and tell me, Nagler, you got me into this. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that it always works. There are also other kinds of power that are in the mix and we have to know when to use which. We have to have the right expectations about what are we going to say if it doesn't get us what we want, if it doesn't protect us. And incidentally, I have found that if you, if you demand of nonviolence that, it, that absolute protection, you'll never get to understand what nonviolence is. There was a person at that Jesuit meeting a couple of weeks ago, you remember, who said 98% of the people will not attack you, but 2% will. It's the wrong way to approach nonviolence. So what are we saying? There is something called the power of vulnerability. We are not saying that it trumps all other kinds of power immediately in any situation. Okay. Good to know that. Kathy? Um, about? Oh. Okay. Was he on your list? <laughs> hmm. I'm sorry. He's actually a holdover from A. But while he w – since you brought it up, Aside from the fact that there is a lovely river in, in Holland called the Waal, and he's from that area, so he's Franz Dwell, Frank from the Waal. Um, what was his importance? Just very briefly, so you might as well know it. It's, it's an important guy. Yeah. Uh, reconciliation, in reconciliation in primates. Yeah, and generally speaking, the fact that primate nature, which we have inherited on one level, is not simply red in tooth and claw. It's not just aggression. He's the guy who told a story about those two chimpanzees who were locked out of their cage in the Chicago Zoo and a terrible rainstorm came up. It was bitter cold and rain was sloshing down. And two of the chimps had been locked out of the cage by mistake. So he found the, uh, the uh, owner or keeper, I guess. And they went over there and opened the cage to let the chimps in. Now the chimps are freezing and getting soaking wet. They want to dive into the cage. But before they did that, they each gave each of these guys a big hug. Isn't that nice? Because, <laughs> of course, being hugged by a wet chimpanzee is not <laughs> my favorite reward. But I mean, you know, on the something. spiritual level, it is something, you know. It shows some form of recognition. <laughs> okay. Those things are about uh, 40 to 50 times stronger than a human being, too. So. A hug from a chimp can be dangerous, but in this case, yeah, I think we get the point. Okay, we have a few more minutes. If there's anything else, maybe stuff that you came across in the reader that we didn't talk about and you want to know, is this fair game or not fair game? How much do you have to know about it? Just go ahead and ask me. Yes? Ah. Okay, Adam is asking about a movement which we were to have gotten to but didn't quite. It's the movement of landless workers. So I think I will declare it off bounds for now. But it'll definitely come up on the final. It's a huge social movement in Brazil. Yes? Yeah, yeah, that came up, yeah. And you have to, you know, define it, tell why it was important, and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So anything that was in our section of the reader will be possible. Okay. Yeah, Paolo. It's in the reader. Yeah. Does anybody want to, like, in 60 seconds, tell us what happened there and 
how to characterize it, why it's important. Famous sauce comes from that region. We all know that. Okay, what was what was the issue? We're going to have a lot of reading to do between now and Thursday. <laughs> yeah, Carrie. Yeah. 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 Yes, all of that is true. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 The what's you you're you're close, Carrie. That's that's pretty good. What set it up was very much this kind of thing. In Mexico, there is a uh, national oil industry, Pemex, and uh, so they didn't have to be make any arrangements. They were all the same animal, and they decided to go. There was offshore oil, and this is a region of Mexico where there's a lot of wetlands. People were fishing and, and uh, agriculture was basically their income. Pemex came in, did this huge extraction, pumped out oil, gave nobody in the region any money for all of those resources. It's very much like what's happening in Nigeria today, southern Nigeria. And that left the place absolutely <laughs> devastated. And uh, the people of Tabasco decided that they would protest this. Nonviolently, again, there was kind of a leader who came from, I think, from Mexico City. His name was Rafael Landareche, who knew how to do this, and he was kind of their Sunderlal Bahuguna. And they said, We are going to be a buffer in between Chiapas and the rest of Mexico. In Chiapas, you had armed insurrection. In Tabasco, we're going to have unarmed insurrection. A buffer there. So it was a, almost by the numbers, by the rules, pretty well organized and carried out. And yes, there was voter fraud, as where is there not? <laughs> Don't look at us. <laughs> yes, Marcel. Um, yeah. Well, the concept of going from poverty to destitution, if it were to show up, and I don't think it will, it, you would attribute it to uh, a sociologist, um, Gur, Robert Gur, was his term. And what he said was, if people are suffering poverty, they can take it quite a bit and it can actually go on indefinitely. But if the poverty increases or if you make it increase to destitution, meaning they can no longer live. Their children are getting deformed. They're dying of malnutrition and all of that. Then they have nothing – there's nothing holding them back anymore. No, so they are going to rebel. So the name of the book where this comes up is Why Men Rebel. Ted Gore is his name, Why Men Rebel. It's just an issue for us because that's where a lot of nonviolent movements get started among quiescent populations. I think that's the name of the book. Yeah. <laughs> I, he didn't know that women also rebelled, I guess. <laughs> but I guess we're out of time. Right? Oh, yes, bring a blue book by all means. In fact, bring two blue books in case the person next to you forgot.